And uh, our topic today is uh, one of several topics that we've been covering as part of uh, Windows Azure. Um, this being the um, option of deploying Active Directory in Windows Azure. And, and we'll get into, um, you know, it seems like a simple topic, but there's honestly a couple different variations and different variations on the arc. Sorry, somebody muted me. So, uh, I, can everybody hear me now? I can hear out in Dallas. Okay. Like I said, sorry, somebody muted me. I was unmuted. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so, uh, we also have uh, many offices across the central region, and uh, Bannockburn being our, our headquarters. A uh, sample of uh, some of our, our clients, and let's get into it. So what is Windows Azure? We're going to start out with a little bit of review. So we, we've already done uh, a webinar uh, as part of this series where we introduced and, and went over Windows Azure. Uh, so I'm going to go back and review just for a moment just to make sure we're all kind of on the same you know, playing, level playing field here. And uh, then we'll get into our topic for today. So. Uh, Windows Azure is um, Microsoft's data centers supporting part of your data center, for example. So it's, it's a virtual environment. It's Hyper-V uh, running Windows or uh, Link. Are people able to see the, the content on my screen? Just got notified that... Uh, yes, we can see. Potentially not. Okay, great. Um, so, if you're thinking about what is Azure, Azure is a virtual environment sitting in Microsoft's data center. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be running Windows. It can also be running several different variations of, of Linux as well. Um, why, why do I care? Why, why do I want that? You know, as far as uh, uh, any IT department today is looking to um, add value to their, their organization, their company, and the way they do that is by delivering best of breed services, but then also trying to save money for the organization. And Azure can be one piece of that. It uh, doesn't mean that you have to move everything out to Microsoft's data center. Um, it's giving you another option to extend your data center out to Microsoft's data center um, with this platform being called Windows Azure. Um, so it helps you out from the economic side, and then it gives you the, the choice of uh, moving some of your, your services to the cloud. Some of the other reasons that uh, um, you might care about this is maybe your data centers today uh, only reside in one country or one state or one city. Uh, but maybe your customers or your users and your offices are global or, uh, you know, maybe even uh, national. Uh, so by using what Microsoft has already spent billions of dollars putting together, you're able to extend your data center out to their data centers and make it your data center a global data center by doing so. So there's uh, eight 
primary data centers around the world from Microsoft. Um, and then there's uh, up to, there's 24 caching locations so that I can take the data or the services, I can put it even closer to my end users or my customers, whatever I'm looking to put out there. And then there's support all over the world. All right, so let's talk uh, about some of the top customer workloads that uh, we look at with Azure, and this is um, about the end of my review of Azure, but uh, I want to just, again, to make sure that we're all on the same playing field. So um, there are more than, than these six that I'm showing, but these are essentially the, the top ones that, that we look at with Azure. It's for uh, putting together um, development environments or proof of concept environments or test environments. Maybe I want to deploy SharePoint, but the uh, SharePoint, the features are available in SharePoint Online maybe don't hit my requirements, and maybe I don't want to put it in my data center because I don't want to manage that infrastructure anymore. Maybe I, I've had SharePoint in my data center for a long time, and the storage requirements have gone out of control. Uh, so maybe I'm looking to uh, reduce my storage costs by m putting SharePoint out in, in Azure. Um, maybe I have uh, a large SQL environment or needs to expand my SQL environment. Uh, so that would be another workload that we see often put into Azure. Uh, what about if I'm deploying Office 365, one of Microsoft's other cloud services? Um, if I want to set up Active Directory Federation with Office 365, meaning single sign-on, it does require some servers or some virtual servers. And typically, I'd have to put that in my data center. Another option would be to take those ADFS servers and put, out, put it out in Azure to support Office, my Office 365 deployment. Again, another um, prime consideration or motivator for customers to uh, look at Azure is uh, they're simply running out of storage. And the price tag to do more um, maybe a little bit more than they can bite off right now, but they still have the need and they may not have the budget, so what do I do? I look for a cheaper option. And so what we talk about with customers is uh, what if we um, take a look at your data that you use often, that you use all the time, and that you've used recently, and we keep that in your data center, and then the things that you don't need very often or you're not uh, doing a lot of transactions on all the time, maybe we look to move that somewhere else. And one option being Windows Azure. And the, the nice part about it is I don't have any upfront cost to go out and purchase that storage. I go out to Windows Azure, I provision what I need, and I pay for what I use. And this is one of the areas we're going to talk about a little bit more today. So what if I want to take some of my application servers that I have today, whether they're virtual or not, and I want to move those out to Windows Azure. I want to get them out of my data center. What kind of plumbing or infrastructure do I need in place to do that or to be able to start doing that? And one of the options that we have to consider and what our topic is about today is talking about that some of that infrastructure being in this case, Active Directory. Do I need directory services out there? Does it have to be a domain control that's part of my domain or not? And that's what, one of the things that uh, uh, we're going to focus on today. And the whole reason um, around this, or the, the whole point around this, I better said, is that uh, we're about giving you the options. So whether uh, the workload or the data is sitting in your data center, right here, if we put it out in Microsoft's data center, or maybe put it in another service provider's data center like ours here at Netrix, we, we offer data center services. This is where we help you decide what makes the most sense 
what's going to maybe hit some of those motivators that you have, some of those goals that you have of saving money and expanding your, your data center to the point that's going to support your business requirements, um, that's where we come in and we help out. All right, so one thing this topic that we're going to talk about today is not is um, so there's there's Azure AD and there's putting AD in Azure. They're, they're two separate topics. The AD, the Azure AD that a lot of customers are already um, kind of equated with, uh, whether they know it or not, is if you've already deployed Office 365 in your environment, you're already using Azure AD. You still have your own AD on-prem. You have Office 365, and it's using Azure AD today. So that's, whether you knew it or not, it, um, you, you may already be using Azure AD. And why, why do we do Azure AD? We do that to be able to um, have directory services so that the application workloads that are part of Office 365 are able to connect back to a user account, maybe the one that we set up synchronization with our on-prem AD, or maybe one that we set up federation with for single sign-on. Um, all those options are available. And so this is what you know my team does often is we deploy Office 365, but it doesn't mean we're putting one of your domain controllers out in, in Windows Azure. We're just using Azure AD, which is free. So a little bit of difference. I just wanted to make sure that everybody's aware of, of that uh, difference. All right, so why should we even need to have a talk about running specific roles on a VM in a cloud, or in this case, being uh, Active Directory? Um, sometimes the primary motivator, and other times it might just be because the service running in the cloud needs it. So uh, if you decide to extend your data center out to Windows Azure, are those services that we put out there going to need Active Directory or not? And if they do need it, does it need to be part of your domain or not? Those are some decision points that we have to, we have to figure out depending on what we're going to put out there. Um, and then we have to look at, okay, what is our topology going to look like? If I do need to put Active Directory out there, uh, should it be a different domain that's part of my forest, or should it be its own forest? Um, and so those are some of the other uh, topologies we're going to look at today. And then, um, obviously, people or, or organizations, IT departments, have been virtualizing Active Directory for a long time. And that's completely supported. It's completely supported uh, here in, in Windows Azure as, as it is on your, in your data center today. But there's some additional pieces along with that, if we put it out with Azure, that we need to think about. And as I'm going through some of these, it's, these are topics or pieces that um, we uh, talk through during design sessions uh, when we do projects like this with our customers. So here's some of the questions uh, I get and some of the considerations that we talk about uh, when we talk about putting uh, Active Directory out in Windows Azure. Is it safe? Yes, it is safe. Should I virtualize it? Yes. We've been virtualizing Active Directory for a long time. Putting it on Windows Azure is no different. Some of the configuration might be a little different, though, and, and we'll get into more of that. Um, what about the placement of my Active Directory database? Uh, in this case, if you put it out there, you, there's different kinds of data that you can, or storage that you can provision in Azure. Um, and you just want to make sure that it's a, 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 a data drive that you put the database on and not, not the OS drive. And that honestly is the same as if we were uh, deploying it on-prem. Um, I do see most of my customers putting it on the same as their OS drive, uh, but 
you know, the option is, is there as well where we don't put it on the OS drive, we, we put it on a separate data drive. What do I need to think about when um, I'm looking at the cost of the transactions going across the wire? I'm, I'm not charged for any inbound traffic, but outbound traffic I am from Windows Azure. So if we take a look at Active Directory, what does that mean? If the domain controller is part of an existing AD site or a Windows site, um, then it's going to have more traffic. If it's a separate site, then it's going to be scheduled traffic in the case of Active Directory replication. And, and this is assuming that it's part of your domain and your forest. Uh, so let's definitely put it in its own site. Um, how could I cut down traffic even more? Take a look at maybe just using a read-only domain controller. There is no replication traffic at that point uh, for no outbound replication traffic. There's inbound replication traffic, but not outbound, which is what you're, you're worried about as far as uh, uh, cost goes. Does it need to be a global catalog or not? So when we talk about um, whether it be a, a read-only domain controller or a global catalog, uh, we really have to look at the workloads that you're looking to put in Windows Azure. and whether it makes sense or whether it's a requirement uh, that they be a full-blown read-write domain controller versus a read-only domain controller and whether global catalog services are needed or not. Um, the other topic that we consider is uh, around trust and replication. What that really comes down to and what I mean by that is should this be a separate domain? Should this be a separate forest? So maybe it's a a separate domain or force I set up a trust with, or maybe it's part of my existing domain and I just replicate it out there. Uh, so those are, uh, you know, topics that to, we need to discuss to see what makes the most sense for, for your environment. Um, one other thing around it being in Windows Azure that's a little bit different from any other virtual environment is the IP addressing scheme. So I cannot support static IPs in Windows Azure. But what I can do is I can set up DHCP and uh, make sure that that server gets the same lease every time. The other advantage that I have is being able to run Active Directory in all the different data centers around the world that, where Microsoft has their assets. A couple other things to consider when we look at uh, putting Windows Azure or putting Active Directory out, out in Windows Azure is uh, one, how do we provision it? What's, what's the best way to do that? What's supported? And then how do we back it up? So, you know, let, let's touch on the backup part and recovery part first. Snapshots are not supported. They're not supported if you have it on prem, they're not supported on Windows Azure. So we just need to make sure we, we understand that and, and we don't try to back up Active Directory by doing snapshots. Um, you can restore uh, virtual drives, but um, again, it, it's restoring virtual drives is, is fairly easy, but it's honestly easier when I, if I need to provision a, a domain controller or a new domain controller, because maybe one's gone bad on me or something, it's actually the best thing to do and the easiest thing to do just stand up a new virtual machine and promote it, just like you were, would do if it were in your data center. We do the same thing in Windows Azure. When we talk about, uh, um, again, uh, the cost of, of uh, some of this traffic going across the network, we, we kind of touched on this already, but uh, uh, one thing just to point out, Inbound traffic is free, outbound traffic is not. So if I'm replicating information to those domain controllers from my data center, that's, that's all free. If that domain controller is now replicating information back to my data center, there is a cost applied to that. Um, it's, it's a nominal cost, it's not much, but something to consider. Um, also, being able to set up a VPN connection, a site-to-site -site VPN with Windows Azure so that I can use domain controllers from, 
from my on-prem Active Directory, there's a cost for that VPN too. Again, it's a nominal cost. It's not one that uh, I've seen any customers um, really, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, bat an eye at, but uh, it, it is a cost. And so if you need that VPN running all the time, 24-7, 365, um, you know, you know what your costs are getting into that versus maybe only turning it on when you need to. You know, the other thing that we talk about there, um, and, and we, I touched on this earlier, is putting these domain controllers in a separate site that you set up in Windows Azure. You know, at that point, you could also turn down site replication from the the uh, the default three hours, or I've even seen you know some customers set it, that down to every half hour. So maybe it only needs to replicate with your on-premise every eight hours, for example. And then read-only domain controllers, they are more cost-effective because I don't have any outbound uh, replication costs coming from them. So is, is implementing a read-only domain controller a no-brainer? In some cases, yes. But you have to, again, look at the applications and workloads you're going to put out in Windows Azure um, and see if it's if it supports a read-only domain controller because not every uh, application or workload does support a read-only domain controller. So we have to figure that out first. The other thing to look at if if we're trying if we're concerned about the type of data that is um, getting um, replicated out to Windows Azure from our Active Directory, the nice part about it is we can turn on uh, read-only filtering filtering so that only certain attributes are replicated out to Windows Azure. So I don't have to replicate every attribute of every object if I don't want to. If, if there's some information in there that can't go outside my data center, that's an option. Uh, should it be a, a global catalog or not? In most cases, when we set up a, a domain controller, as a, a, a person that's a long time been setting up domain controllers and, and deploying those for customers, um, we typically make every Active Directory domain controller a global catalog, meaning that there's a subset of data for every domain in my environment uh, put into the global catalog so that applications that know how to look up that data as part of the global catalog can do, get to the information they're looking for more quickly. So uh, and one example is, is Exchange. When Exchange is building the global address list for what you look at in Outlook, they gr Exchange grabs that from a global catalog service running on domain controller. It doesn't look at the whole directory when it builds that list. Uh, and so that'd be one example. So again, depending on what workloads we put out in Windows Azure, we may not need a global catalog. And if we don't, that's one of the things we can take off and save a little bit of money as far as uh, replication traffic. Trust or replicate. So again, this goes back to the, um, what the considerations page that I had up earlier when we talk about uh, do we want uh, our domain extended out into Windows Azure? In many cases, the answer is yes when I talk to customers because they're looking to move some of their existing assets that they have in their data center out to Azure. And so those applications um, those servers that we're looking to move out there are already part of their existing domain and so they need a local domain controller to authenticate to and so we, we put those as part of their domain. We put it in a separate Windows site but it's still part of their domain and then we can go about migrating some of those servers or virtual machines uh, out to Windows Azure. Um, but if you're looking to set up some new applications or workloads for your environment or migrate uh, some existing services out to Windows Azure. Uh, if, it's, if it is a new, if it is a migration, then it comes back to um, 
do I set up a new domain? Do I set up a new forest? And a lot of those uh, decision points are around what are my, my requirements around authentication, security, administration, uh, you know, how does that all break down? If I need to have a, a, a security layer or a replication layer between what's out in Azure versus on-prem, then we're looking at an additional domain or additional forest. Additional forest is only one true um, security barrier. Uh, additional domain is more of a replication barrier. We talked about this earlier, um, and I'm sure many people are like, what, there's, there's no static IPs in Windows Azure? There isn't, but honestly, it, it doesn't really matter because we can give a server uh, an IP. We still have to set it up for DHCP, but we can still, through DHCP leasing, lease the same IP over and over again because it, it won't expire as long as the, the VM is, is uh, you know, still in uh, op, uh, op, operation. What we can't do is try to work around it. So um, if you're, so you set up a machine and it gets a, an IP lease from DHCP services and you want to go ahead and take that IP that you're given and uh, go into your network settings and assign it to the NIC um, and start just using that going forward, that's what you don't want to do because if the lease time is ever up, which it will be, leases on DHCP only last so long, um, you're going to make it so that we can never get to that VM again. So we want to, we don't want to try to work around it. What we want to do is, is just make sure we know about it and make sure we know that, okay, when the lease is up, because how I have it set up here in DHCP, it's going to get the same IP over and over again. So I, I don't care that I'm, you know, have it set up for DHCP, which on-prem is a no-no. If you're setting up a, a new domain controller on-prem, you're not going to set it up for DHCP. So this is, this is a little bit different, but we can work around it, and it's safe, and it, it works. The other thing what we want to do is we want to deploy DNS out in Windows Azure. We don't want to have to have reliance across the, the VPN back to my on-prem. Uh, we still want to point some servers back on-prem, maybe as their primary or secondary, um, but uh, uh, we also want them to be able to get the name resolution um, out there in Windows Azure in case, for whatever reason, my, v my VPN is down. All right, so let's talk about some architecture options. Let's start off with a very simple scenario. No domain controllers, uh, even in Windows Azure, only on-prem Active Directory. And this is what that would look like. In this scenario, everything that I put out in Windows Azure that's part of my domain is going to have to authenticate across the VPN tunnel. And that's OK. That works. But the downside is what happens if that VPN tunnel goes down? Then none of my services that need to authenticate again will remain running. They'll start shutting down over time. Not right away, though. So what do I do? I could set up a domain controller in Azure and authenticate locally. In this model, Windows, the Azure AD will replicate in the new AD site uh, with the on-prem AD. The big difference now is that when I authenticate local, if I do have too much latency across that VPN or that VPN is down, I don't have to worry about it because everything's authenticating local. So if you still want or still need Active Directory out in Azure, but you don't want a part of your corporate domain or your corporate network, um, that's where we, we think about setting up a separate domain or separate forest uh, for that extranet 
out in Windows Azure. So this would be a, another option. All right, so we've talked a lot about uh, putting Active Directory out in Azure. Where do we go from here? So when I talk to customers and, and we first start talking about uh, putting anything in Azure, we have to start talking about, okay, what's our infrastructure going to look like to support what we're putting out in Azure? Active Directory comes up as uh, one of the first topics. Um, so then we have to go back and we have to look at, okay, uh, what's our roadmap? What are we looking to move out to Azure now versus later? What do we need to support now versus later? What's our roadmap for all these different services and technologies that my users use today? And let's map all that out and then make sure that when we're putting together a design for Azure, we're putting it together properly to not only support uh, what you're trying to do now, but also in the future. And so that's where these topics come into play of, of uh, uh, putting together that roadmap, looking at the return on investment, and what success criteria we need to hit, what requirements do we need to um, make sure we, 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 we get to. Um, and so we we do those assessments with our, our customers at the beginning of these projects. Um, sometimes uh, we'll go out and we'll do that as part of pre-sales so that we can understand with the customer um, where they're trying to go today uh, versus uh, maybe a year from now or three years from now. And, and so we'll help our customers do those roadmaps. Um, and then let's go ahead and start extending our our data center out to Azure. Let's set up that VPN connection. Let's go ahead and deploy Active Directory out in Azure. And then let's look at, okay, what other uh, services uh, should we put out there first? Maybe we take some of our file shares and we put those out there first um, and, and just move those shares. Uh, keep the share the same as it is today so that uh, I don't have to, to change any of my login scripts, for example, or any of my group policies, um, and, but we just move them out to, to Azure as the change. Uh, or maybe if I have Office 365 deployed or are going to deploy Office 365, maybe those federation servers, ADFS servers, I put those in Azure. Or maybe I put some on-prem and some in Azure, like one and one perhaps. And so that's, that's another... Uh, solution that uh, we see oftentimes that our customers do right in the beginning. All right, so uh, next month, just so everybody knows, uh, we are looking to talk uh, to continue this webinar series. And next month, what we're looking at is talking about storage in Windows Azure. So uh, the topic of uh, taking um, backup data, taking archive data, taking snapshots, uh, data that I don't access all the time, that maybe um, my users only access once a month, or uh, stuff that you know they, they don't access a lot. You know, what are my options with that data? So we're going to touch on some of that next month. Some things I want to remind everybody about is that uh, we do have a uh, promotion going along with Microsoft right now. It's called Office 365 Fast Track, uh, where we'll come out and we'll get a, a pilot started uh, with Office 365 for free with you. Uh, let you kick the tires before you spend any money. And then once you um, are decided to move to Office 365, uh, Microsoft has some funding available depending on how many seats you're looking to move to Office 365. And that funding is available to partners like us to help you with those deployment services. Uh, so Microsoft is, is helping to, to, to augment uh, or uh, um, fully pay for those deployment services in some cases. All right, give me one moment here. I'm going to open this up. So I've unmuted the audience, and it still means you have to unmute yourself, but you're able to now. Does anybody have any questions for me?
Again, if you, if you have questions, uh, please unmute yourself. One of the things I've also put out there is a, a poll. Let me uh, open up this poll. So if, uh, how many of you are considering Windows Azure today? If you would please uh, check one of those for me, um, I'd appreciate it, just so I get an idea of, of what everybody's thinking. Okay, getting uh, a few replies here. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, your time today. I appreciate it. Um, if uh, you're looking for that uh, um, $10 gift card for lunch, uh, please send Pam an email. Let her know that uh, you were uh, on this webinar series today, and she will send one out to you. Um, she was the one that sent you the invite to begin with, so just reply back to her. Let her know that uh, you attended um, and that you liked, liked Ryan's presentation quite a bit. Um, and uh, then we'll see you this time uh, next month to talk about storage in Windows Azure. Thank you very much, everybody.